for our next keynote conversation, you'll be hearing from the Chief People Officer at Farfetch, Sean Keane, and the Chief Technology Officer at Wayfair, Fiona Tan, for a discussion on becoming a great leader. They will be interviewed by Shop Talk Europe's Vice President of Content, Rebecca Femhenna. All right, so Sean and Fiona, welcome to Shop Talk Europe's main stage. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Great to have you. So let's dive right in. And Fiona, I'll let uh, this question's for you first. So how are, how is your identity and your past experiences shaping your approach to leadership? Can you talk us through? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, first off, absolutely. I think our past life experiences and work experiences uh, have a big part to play in terms of how we grow as leaders. Um, first off, I would say I'm a big believer in um, competitive sports and the relationship within that and, and growing a, good, uh, a strong leader. Um, and so I'd say personally, from my experience, you know, I've lost a lot of matches. I played competitive tennis all the way through college. And it's been great from the point of view of building resilience and, and learning how to use your failures um, to succeed later on. And I think one of my favorite quotes um, was, you know, Michael Jordan as a basketball player. And we all know how, how amazingly successful he was. And one of his one of my favorite quotes of his is how he talks about um, like the 9,000 shots that he's missed, the 300 games that he's lost, the 26 times they gave him the, t the ball to make that game-winning shot and he missed, right? And, and he talks about how those failures are why he's so successful today. So I think it's a, it's a really um, very important example, right, of that. Uh, the second thing I would say from sports is just also learning that you have to keep moving on, right? You, you play a good point, you play a bad point, it's done with, there's nothing you can do about it, you have to keep moving forwards. Um, so I think that's a, another thing that I've, I've, I've learned from, um, from sports as well. And, and so certainly uh, th that was a big part of my sort of life experiences that have helped me. Uh, the other couple of things I would say is, you know, mentorship, um, um, folks that have helped me a lot from, a, from, a, from the point of view of being champions and supporters. Um, as a woman in technology, there have not been a lot of women, for example, that I could have looked up to growing up in my career. So I'm a total equal opportunist as, as far as um, getting help and advice from folks. And I've had a couple of really wonderful men in, um, in my working career that have been that. They've been really good supporters and great real role models of leadership for me to look up to. So that's been really awesome. Um, and I think the last part is just Really, um, you know, my, my career, I, I start, I've always been in technology, but I started out in enterprise software and, and gone through that. And there were certainly a couple of cycles of um, reinvention of companies, et cetera. And then I moved into e-commerce and retail about 10 years ago. Um, and within that, there's been a lot of uh, digital transformation, organizational transformation, um, and cultural transformation that I went through both at Walmart and then not Wayfair. And a lot of those experiences really um, do apply one across the other, even though they may be different industries. And um, I've certainly been able to tap into that as I've grown my career. Thank you. Shan, what about you? Yeah, so just a bit of background. Um, I'm Sri Lankan. Both my parents are from Sri Lanka and they traveled to England in their teenage years. Um, and so I then grew up in Australia, um, very white Australia, um, in a rural uh, city. And um, I was the first person to go to university. And I think the impact that that's had on me as a leader is that as I've progressed through my career, my confidence and my passive nature has been something that I've really had to work on over the years. So fast forward right through to a boardroom level role and being quite a small woman and a mother as well, there's really things that I've had to do to be able to take up space and be heard and, and have an impact at, 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 a, at a C level role. And I think subsequently, um, for me as a leader, one of the things I get the most joy out of is being able to help anyone in any small way who has had you know, a similar type of background or has come from a, an underrepresented group and seeing them succeed is like just one of the most um, happy things that I can do as a leader. Can you share some tangible examples, Shan, of kind of the types of initiatives that at Farfetch that you're creating to create the type of work environment that you that we, you know you would have benefited from as you were progressing your own career as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, just breaking that example down a little bit further, in order to be able to really 
be self-aware and understand the things that you need to work on, having programs that can really help from a, um, a feedback point of view, to be able to help from coaching, mentoring, sponsorship, are all the things that are so incredibly valuable. And they're the types of initiatives that we've built at Farfetch, both for the general population and then for more of our underrepresented groups. It's creating pathways into schools and universities where people might not have the same level of opportunity as um, more well-educated um, people who are entering their careers to be able to join businesses like Farfetch and then re really leaning into those programs, both from a hiring as well as career development and progression perspective. But, but the thing that I think is the most powerful is getting that mentoring and sponsorship both internally and from external experts. And Chan, and again to you, you, you mentioned that one of your most interesting journeys that you've been on in terms of leadership recently has been, um, you know, Farfetch's global expansion. What have been some of the biggest leadership lessons, learnings, challenges that you've had throughout that journey so far? Um, and, and how have you overcome the challenges there? Yeah, so just for some context, I joined Farfetch when we were 100 people in three countries, and we're now around 6,500 people in 23 countries across the Farfetch group, and that progression has been over the last 10 years. Um, and so I think in the early days, our local countries were, were much more contained. So we had local leaders working in one country, managing teams who were local. And then again, fast forward that to where we are today, every single one of our senior leaders is responsible for teams in um, multi-geographies. Uh, and so I think the level of responsibility that goes into that, for, for me, one of the biggest things that it falls under the, the people um, agenda is the cost base, um, which for us is, you know, a relatively big line given we're six and a half thousand people. So really trying to think about things like compensation and rewards when you're dealing with rational numbers, but every decision around that is emotional because you're thinking about, you know, people's careers, their well-being, their, you know, personal lives, trying to create fairness and unbiased processes. So I think for leaders who are managing um, teams in, in multi-geographies, really starting to think about how you make all of those things work is, is really important. And, and how do you do that? How, how do you overcome um, this challenge? We probably don't have enough time to cover that in <laughs> 20 minutes, but I think the biggest thing is really creating frameworks, uh, setting clear agendas, making sure that everyone who's involved in those processes understands the structures that you're working within, and then understanding um, where it is that you need to um, really stick to the rules and where you might have some fluidity and how that might need to change your processes over time as the organization evolves. So for, for Farfetch, we've grown at such a rapid rapid speed, we can't create a process and expect it to last through that level of journey. Yeah. And Fiona, you know, you two are growing a, a very fast growing global tech team. Um, what have been some of the specific leadership challenges that, that you faced um, and kind of how have you overcome these as well? Yeah, so certainly I think we're very, very similar to what you said. I think the teams are becoming much more geographically distributed and even the the models, right, where it, you have, in some cases, uh, employees, in-house employees, you're also working with outsourced partners, you're looking at staff augmentation models, you're looking at also how you want to incorporate centers of excellence, right? So a lot of that is changing and even the way we work has changed a lot, right? So where in the past we've looked at very centralized, large teams to now bring many more distributed, um, agile working teams, empowered product teams. So all these things are, are, are changing and I think one of the things that we're trying to also figure out is how do you, how do you learn and iterate your way through um, and then if you kind of factor in uh, the last couple of years, right, and with the global pandemic and you've got technologists all over the world, also realizing that actually you're quite productive when you are um, working from home, how do you factor all that in to, to make sure that you have a good working environment with a geographically distributed team? And one of the things that we've found, especially again, you know, with Wayfair being a tech-enabled retailer, one of the things we've found is that it's super important for our technologists to have really strong business knowledge and really understand how the business is run. And so in the past where you have um, fewer offices and people can come in more often, those serendipitous um, meetings, right, between the, say, the developers and the commercial folks um, 
um, just happen spontaneously, right? And so those are now things that are a lot harder to come by. So you have to be much more intentional about and almost prescriptive around like when when would you come in? Which are the days that you're going to come in so that you can ensure that there is that little bit of that meeting of the minds between the developers and the commercial folks, operators, etc. So we're p kind of putting all those things in practice as we're building out, you know, we, we still need to make sure we have these well-rounded um, business savvy technologists and what do you do um, in this world that has, you know, kind of changed a bunch. Yeah. Shan, over to you now. We are undoubtedly living in turbulent times. You know, there's a lot of people that are very strongly opinionated about issues uh, in society. You know, we had the example from Apple recently. They lost one of their top engineers because Apple mandated uh, that their employees return to the office and that went against his personal values, so he left the business. What do you do as a leader when, you know, people in the organization have different opinions? Is it something that you embrace? Um, how do you approach it as a leader to kind of ensure cohesion across the organization? Yeah, and I think, you know, for the, for the people role in the last two years, there's just been so many things that have been very volatile and turbulent when it comes to thinking about uh, your talent within your organisation. Um, so, I th it for, and it's all relatively uncharted territory if we think about the pandemic. Um, you know, there's been... Um, situations such as Black Lives Matter, there's the, you know, what do organizations want to do with remote work and, and mobility? Um, it's kind of one after, after the other. And I think everyone has an opinion. And for me, I think everyone's opinions are really valuable. But what's important is really trying to understand the reasoning behind those opinions. So I spend quite a, little, a lot of time trying to really understand what people's perspectives are. I'm a big believer that you can get more out of your decision if you really build on those perspectives, particularly when I think about our executive team, some of the best decisions we've made is when we've layered on each other's opinions but built it into something really great that's been um, wonderful for the organisation. So I spend a bit of time listening to those opinions but I try and remove fears because there can often be a lot of fear of the unknown or a fear of what might happen if we don't do something and then start to think about well what will, is the rational impact of our decision here over the long term um, and start to think about much more into the future um, once that decision has been made. So it's a little bit like playing a, a jigsaw puzzle before you get to the end result and then make very clear recommendations about what the right steps are forward. You make it sound very easy. Removing fear, how can you give some examples of kind of how you do that and then you know effectively? Um, oh, God, I'm not quite sure how I do that effectively. I hope I do it effectively. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if we take something uh, like our response to remote work and, and global mobility, uh, every day people are reading both our, all of our six and a half thousand employees plus our executive team and our board are reading about what other organizations are doing. Um, and I think it's really important to look outwards, but I think it's more important to look inwards um, and think about what it is that we want to do. Plus, there's a big, you know, there's a big factor of what the CEO wants to do, particularly in founder-led organizations. So I think it's great to, for us to do that research and think outward, but then we really need to come to the heart of our values as an organization and what we want from our people. So we take a big focus on listening to our people, asking them what they want. For us, we need to use a lot of surveys because we're just such a broad base now. Um, and then taking it back to to the values of the organization, the CEO's belief and the executive level's recommendations, and then setting out you know, clear guidelines and criteria. I'll often, we'll often write something and then test it. We sometimes trial things um, to see if they work. If we're concerned about if it's the right thing to do, we might choose a subset of the organization or do it for shorter periods of time and then build and iterate and, and grow from there. And, you know, Everyone talks today about the importance of corporate culture. How do you at Farfetch ensure that you're hiring people whose culture, uh, whose values align with the, the, the culture and the values of the organization and that your employees, once they're employed by you, continue to live and, uh, you know, a abide by these company values, if, if you'd like to say that word, kind of how do you how do you do both of those things? Yeah, well, I'm incredibly passionate about the values at Farfetch. It's one of the first projects I worked on when I joined uh, close to 10 years ago. Um, we take a relatively structured approach uh, to being, being able to build, uh, keep our values you know, alive and thriving as the organization grows. So when it comes to uh, hiring, promotion, performance reviews, 
um, any assessments as you're making decisions about pe how people progress, are hired and progress through the organization. We have our three good fours. So that's good for Farfetch, good for role, and good for growth. Um, and so good for Farfetch is our values. Good for role is your ability to do the job and good for growth is your ability to scale with the organization. Um, and so when we talk about good for Farfetch, we have, you know, interview questions, we have unbiased uh, wash up processes in our performance review. That's a whole section in the performance review. Um, and for promotions, we have to, people have to build business cases that show alignment to the values. So that's the sort of structural work around the values. I think the storytelling piece is huge. Um, and again, just for context, 45% of our population have been with Farfetch since the pandemic. So they were hired remotely. Um, and what's really important about that is that they haven't lived and breathed and touched the values from an office space. So it's really important to tell stories about um, the values, whether it's a team level or, or a people level through all of our channels. Um, you know, we have town halls very regularly, all hands, team moments, celebrations throughout the year and we really weave that in. But I think one of the most important things as well is um, when we take action. So right up to executive level, if we feel that somebody um, isn't living the values, I think taking action on that is really important uh, because that's the authentic way of, of really telling whether or not, you know, a business is behind the values. Yep. 45% of your employees were hired during the pandemic. I think that's super impressive. I think that's shown how fast and how much right. you've grown as well in the past couple of years as well. Um, Fiona, over to you. Being part of a great leader is, you know, sharing news that might not be popular with everyone um, and kind of leading the business through tough times or your team through, through tough times. How do you have these tough conversations yet keep your teams motivated? Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, I think we can all agree that the last couple of years have been very challenging for our employees. And so we certainly want to be empathetic. But at the same time, you know, with everything that's going on with the volatile, um, you know, economy and, and as well as what all is going on in the world, right? Just being very transparent, I think, with uh, our folks in terms of what's going on. And, and especially when it comes to, I think you mentioned, um, being a, a cost, some of the cost uh, things that you all are doing, but same thing, right? It's like being transparent, especially when, it, when you talk about things that are hard to hear. Um, there are measures that we need to take that are going to be, you know, especially in this business climate, that are going to be more cost controlling, right? So again, I think being as transparent as possible and, and having folks kind of understand that, because I think over time, that is that trust that you build with the, with the employee base. So certainly being transparent around some of the cost measures we have to take. And then the other thing is that I think with Wayfair and a lot of businesses, I think, think about it this way, is um, we're very business outcome and customer outcome focus. So the framework for that hasn't really changed much. It's around how do you think about like potentially uh, specific outcomes may change. And so again, being really transparent, having folks um, help in solutioning. And in the last part around, you, you know, the, the actual feedback, I think now more than ever, we have to be very um, actionable, uh, giving actionable feedback. It has to be data driven and has to be timely, um, particularly because of the, the way things are going right now with the business and, and things that are changing. It's got to be much more agile. Um, I think employees deserve and re really expect to hear real time feedback. And so we've been really focused on doing that. We have performance review cycles. I'm sure you do too. But we've been much more focused around giving uh, feedback, not waiting till the performance cycle is there, but just giving feedback in the moment so that it's it's more actionable. And again, it's, you know, we need to be that much more timely with it right now. Shan, we spoke um, earlier around kind of the, you know, as we mentioned earlier in our chat as well, um, we're going through turbulent times. The role of the chief, chief people's officer has changed quite a bit in, in recent years, and you're expected to kind of make decisions around issues that no one really has a solution for. Um, and because of that, we've seen a lot of uh, chief people officers kind of leaving the roles and transitioning and, and doing something different. Um, how do you as a leader kind of essentially avoid burnout? What do you do to keep resilient um, and, and keep going? Um, so I, so I recently had a feedback assessment, and one of the one of the things is the Clifton Strengths for anyone who's done it. Uh, one of my my highest scoring things was around um, discipline, and so I think discipline is something that I. Uh, 
do a lot of mm -hmm. in terms of myself and my own well-being and creating rituals uh, throughout the week and throughout my day. Um, you know, I think leaders these days have multiple balls thrown at them from every single direction. And in order to make clear decisions and to be able to clear, uh, clearly think about uh, the challenge that you've got at hand, you have to have a clear mind, otherwise your brain can take over and that's where the irrational decision making and, and real problems come in. Um, so I have time in my day, every morning I get up before my kids, um, make sure that I do some form of exercise, not that I'm any, anywhere near a competitive sport level, but just something that keeps me happy. Um, I like to walk my dog, I make sure that uh, those those moments are really carved out. Um, and also the mo moments of my children, otherwise I get quite resentful if I'm not able to do that and if work you know, comes above. So I think that constant balance of trying to carve out that time actually I think makes me a better decision maker uh, because I have those moments where I can think more clearly and calmly about the challenge at hand. That's great. Well, I could speak to the two of you all day and I wish, we, I wish I could. I wish we had time for it, but unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us and thank you everyone to li for listening. <laughs>